Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Benton, and I'm going to spend this session telling you how to get started implementing machine learning algorithms for primarily scale-out parallelism on Apache Spark. Um, uh, this talk is going to have a mixture of high-level concepts and principles and some code examples, and I have some uh, examples in both Python and Scala. And my intention here is twofold. I want the examples to appeal to a large percentage of the audience. I imagine some people prefer Python and some people prefer Scala. And in some cases, it's, it's necessary to use different languages to talk about different practical concerns. Uh, but I hope that you'll find the examples accessible uh, no matter what your favorite language is. And if I've used a feature that's not universally available, I'll try and explain it. Um, let's first, though, talk about a few reasons why you might want to build a parallel machine learning algorithm for Spark. I think it's really common for teams to develop new techniques in rich statistical or machine learning environments and then put these into production on the JVM. How many people have a workflow that sort of looks like that where you have someone working in R or scikit-learn and then they sort of port techniques over to Spark for production? Okay, a few, a few, few people. So, but a lot of times the framework you're using in production like Spark and MLlib isn't as flexible as that prototyping environment and maybe it offers something that's close to what you need but doesn't exactly fit your requirements. So you maybe need a different distance metric or a different split criterion, and you need to sort of implement that yourself. Maybe you recently read a paper and are inspired to try out a new technique, but there isn't an implementation that you can use at scale. Or maybe you have a technique that you like from another library and you'd be happy to just use that off the shelf. You could easily integrate that into Spark by gluing it into your production code, but you'd really like to benefit from the generality of Spark and tighter integration with the rest of the ecosystem by running a scale-out implementation. As we saw this morning, Project Hydrogen is going to be super exciting for these use cases, but it's still nice to be able to extend Spark natively. So a couple of years ago, I wanted to see if self-organizing maps would be a good technique for finding anomalies in infrastructure logs. They, they actually turned out to be, but in order to find that out, I had to implement self-organizing maps for Spark so that I could evaluate them against months worth of log data from one of our data centers at work. More recently, I decided that I wanted to make this code available to other users in a library, which meant solving some new problems. So the rest of this talk is the story of what I learned along the way. But we'll start with a quick overview of the self-organizing map technique in order to provide some context. We'll then discuss some of the challenges involved with taking a, parallel te a serial technique from a paper and translating it to a parallel technique. And we'll pay particular attention to the details we have to worry about when we're realizing a parallel algorithm using Spark's parallel collections. We'll look at what we need to do to extend our basic implementation to support more modern APIs, and we'll close with some practical suggestions to keep in mind as you develop your own techniques, including ways to ensure that your code can benefit from hardware parallelism. But let's start with that quick overview of self-organizing maps. Self-organizing maps are an unsupervised learning technique for producing a low-dimensional and discrete representation of a feature space. The basic idea is that you want to learn a map so that examples that are similar in the feature space are close together on the map. So this is a technique that's useful for visualization and dimensionality reduction, and it has some things in common with clustering. But if that explanation doesn't make a lot of sense, maybe a movie will be better. So let's see what happens as you train one of these maps. We're starting with a random map and training it with color data using angular similarity in the RGB color space to identify similar colors. As this training progresses, each example affects a smaller and smaller neighborhood of the map until eventually the effect of any individual example in the map is extremely localized. And we can see this in progress over time as we started with the random map. We went to a desaturated and washed out map. And finally, we have identifiable areas of color in different parts of the map. In the classic online training algorithm for self organizing maps, we'll start with an initial map. In this case, we've initialized it to random cells as we did in the movie, but there are other techniques we could use as well. We then repeatedly consider the examples in our training set. When we see an example, we identify the entry in the map closest to it, which we call the best matching unit. We then update the map to bring the entries around the best matching unit closer to our example. We do this so that the best matching unit is affected the most and so that units further away are affected less and less. This technique is pretty powerful and you can even fit an implementation of it on a single slide. By processing the training set in random order every time we pass through it, we prevent the accidental organization of our training data from biasing our map. There are a couple of interesting hyperparameters here, how we define the neighborhood size and the learning rate, both of which we define as functions of training time whose value decreases over time. The neighborhood size controls how much of the map around the best matching unit is affected by any particular example. 
and the learning rate controls how much closer to the example the affected area will get. We thus update the map by bringing the neighborhood of the best matching unit for each example slightly closer to the example under consideration. So I hope that code is pretty easy to understand at at least a high level, but it isn't immediately clear how we could implement it in parallel. And a lot of serial implementations of machine learning algorithms rely on code patterns that are difficult to parallelize. So we'll look at some of those and see how to work around them. But first, why should we care about things that are difficult to run in parallel? I mean, computers are fast, right? Uh, but things that make programs hard to run in parallel also put a hard upper bound on how fast we can make them run altogether. Amdahl's law shows us that the upper bound on how much overall speed up we can get from parallelizing our programs is a function of the amount of time our programs spend in code that we can parallelize at all. So if we spend 90% of our execution time on strictly serial code, the theoretical best we could do, even if we had infinite parallelism and free communication, is just a 10% speed up. So as a real world example, let's say you wanted to make a million small loaves of bread that you can cook quickly, like think of pitas or naan. You can cook a pita in like four or five minutes, and if you have sufficient oven or griddle space and you're extremely coordinated, you